Right. Okay, good to, uh, good to see you all. So, we're going to um, carry on going through Luke uh, 23. We're now coming right up to the crucifixion of Jesus. By the way, there's um, loads of multivitamins and um, Panadol that are there. They are free if you'd like to take one, uh, one each, uh, if, if you fancy them. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Cindy. Right, so let's, uh, let's, just start, let's just start with a prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus to pray your special blessing on us as we try to think about the death and the sufferings of your Son. And we pray that we might see in his sufferings something of us and our suffering and that we might believe that because he died and lives we also, although we will die, we shall also live with him. Please strengthen us that we might be in him and for him and with him. For his sake. Amen. Amen. So, Luke 23. The whole company of them arose and brought Jesus before Pilate. They have, the Jews have tried Jesus at night. All through the night. Is that a time when you normally have a court case? Does a court sit during the night? Well, normally, the whole point of this whole thing is that people are absolutely, absolutely so unjust to the Lord Jesus. So, they then bring him early in the morning, probably just at, uh, at sunrise, they bring him to Pilate because the Jews say, oh, he's worthy of death. And the Jews didn't have the power to put anyone to death. The Romans, because they were under the Romans, the Romans had to agree to this. So they bring him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, say, We found this man perverting our nation and forbidding giving tribute to Caesar and saying that he is Christ the King. Well, that's not actually the reason that they, the Jews, gave him the death sentence. They gave him the death sentence because he said, I'm the Son of God. And they said, Oh, if you say that, uh, you've got to be killed for blasphemy. There's no law. Not in the law of Moses, nor any Jewish law that says you've got to kill a man if he says he's the son of God. But that's what they twisted it into. And now they change the accusation. They say to Pilate, he forbade giving tribute to Caesar. Well, that, that was a straight out lie. We looked at it uh, uh, some weeks ago now. When they came to Jesus and tried to catch him out on this very point, they brought the tribute money that had the image of Caesar on the back of it, like so a British coin has got the head of the Queen, probably now the King, uh, on the back of it. And they said, so should we uh, pay tribute to Caesar? He said, give me the tribute money. He said, whose image is on this? And they said, Caesar's. So he said, well, give to Caesar. What is Caesar's? Yes, pay the tribute. But give to God what is God's. And what has got God's image on it is our bodies, because we are made in the image and likeness of God. So as the Lord often does... He quotes this far higher principle. They were on about, oh, should we pay tribute to Caesar? And he says, well, yeah, if the coin has got Caesar's image on it, we'll pay it, give it to him. Then. Give, yeah, give tribute to Caesar. But what's got God's image on it? That's you. That's you, you your body, because you are made in the image and likeness of God. Give that, your whole being, your whole person, give that to God. Now, that's such a big issue, that paying tribute to Caesar is neither here nor there. So he didn't forbid paying tribute to Caesar, but they come frog-marching him up to Pilate, who was the Roman governor, and they say, look, he, he, uh, he, he forbade giving tribute to Caesar. Now, everything that happened to the Lord Jesus, in some way, is there so that we can never say, no one knows how I feel, nobody went through my experiences. Uh, yeah, because he suffered so much, that is why he has got a fellow feeling with every one of us. Maybe it is so that, yeah, nobody knows how you feel. Absolutely, nobody knows how you feel. Nobody quite went through your experiences, your pain, your whatever. Yeah, a bit. But there is somebody who actually did, in, its, in essence, and that person is the Lord Jesus, who's in heaven. But that, the distance is neither here nor there. So, 
what they said is so unjust and so untrue. And it's, a, it's like a kangaroo court. But they're doing it under the appearance of, you know, it's all legal. Well, to pry out a man all through the night, condemn him to death for saying he's the son of God, which is not a criminal, it's not like a criminal issue anyway, and to then take him to Pilate and accuse him now of a whole different raft of accusations that were not true anyway, at an early morning special court, no. Um, but the point is, have you suffered with injustice? Have you been in a position where people say things about you that you know that is so untrue, that is actually the very opposite of what is true? I believe every one of us, because we're not like kids here, are we? I believe we've all been through that. Where someone has said something about you that is maybe online or face to face or put a gossip out, you know. Someone has said something about you that is so not true. And not only is so untrue, it is actually the very opposite of the truth. And when that happens, all the hackles come up and, and we're angry and we desperately want to open our mouth and say, that's not true. That, no, 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 you're lying. No, no, no. Everything in us, because we're human, that, that's what we want to do. And so in those moments, you see, this is exactly the situation that Jesus was in. And so this is why, or one reason, why he suffered so much. So that in that intense experience of him suffering now and then dying in crucifixion, so that nobody can say that, well, he doesn't know, nobody knows how I feel. Poor me. Yeah, maybe nobody does know how you feel on this earth, but Jesus does. And this is one window, if you like, under this question of why did he have to suffer so much? And so people can say, you know, oh, oh, you know I need a saviour just like me. I need someone who can relate to me. Yeah, absolutely. And you have it in the Lord Jesus because he suffered this very wide range of experiences so that man is not alone. You are not alone. I am not alone. Emmanuel, God with us, which is the title of the Lord Jesus. In the sense that, because he had our human nature, he was absolutely able and did experience the essence of everything. So, the amazing thing with Jesus at this time is that he was so quiet. He said so little. And as I say, in those situations, you, you want to open your mouth. So Pilate asked him, so are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, you say it. And actually, that is the only thing he says. In all this, it's like when he was tried by the Jews before this, and they said, are you the son of God? He basically says, so you say. Why doesn't he use this as an opportunity to kind of, you know, preach and all that? I think what he's saying is, you know in your conscience, like the Jews, that I am the Son of God. You ask me if I am the King of Israel. You know that I am. You know I am. You, you yourself say it. So, I think that the point is that people do know subconsciously, that is beneath your actual conscious level of awareness, they know that the gospel is true. That when people encounter the gospel, they know this is true. There's a hole in the human heart that only Jesus Christ can fill. And we are resisting that call if we deny that. And I told you the other day, when I was a young guy, 40 years ago, I was walking the streets uh, around here, not so far away from here, and I, I would do two things, a young fella. I, I was trying to sell double glazing, knocking on the door as this young fella with his tie around his neck, you know, and all that, trying to look older than I was, um, trying to sell double glazing. And people looked at me with pity and said, no, it's okay, thanks dear, you know. So I didn't get very far with selling double glazing. 
But on those same streets on a Saturday, I would go out door to door preaching the gospel. And the reaction was totally different. You knock on the door, trying to sell someone double glazing, and say, that's okay, mate, right no. Oh, okay, yeah. You knock on the door and start telling people about Jesus Christ. Oh, hang, that's a totally different reaction. People are totally on the defensive. Their body language is totally different. What I learned from that is that everybody has got a conscience, a deep conscience. If you knocked on that door, those doors, and said, you know what? There's a guy called Larry, and he's a pink elephant, and he lives in a spaceship up there, and I really advise you to believe in him, because Larry, who lives in the pink spaceship, he's a wonderful bloke. People would say, like, you know, people would say, check your meds, mate, you know, like, sort of, you know, check yourself in, you can get counselling for that, go to the NHS. People wouldn't be annoyed. But if you start talking about Jesus Christ, ooh, oh, oh, oh yeah, people's, people are quite different, you know. Why? If it's all a load of rubbish, why? Why be like that? Because they know. Because they know in their heart of hearts that this is true. So, out of that arises a lot of things. Don't think that anybody is disinterested actually in the gospel. It's all a front. People say, I'm an atheist, don't give me all that God stuff. No, no, no. no nobody's an atheist. As is often said, nobody's an atheist on the plane that's going down. Everyone's crying to some form of God. Right? Um, so, what does it mean for us? Surrender. Just surrender to that voice of conscience. Stop fighting it. Stop putting on acting tough, acting brave. Surrender to the voice of conscience. And now you come to the issue of Pilate, and that continues this theme. Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, Well, I find no fault in this man. And as we're going to go through the account here, you see Pilate is clearly struggling with his conscience. He says, there's nothing wrong with this guy. What's, what's your problem? But they were the more urgent, so he stirs up the people, teaching from all Judea, beginning from Galilee, even to this place. When you put Matthew, Mark, Luke and John together, that's the four gospel accounts, you really get this picture of Pilate totally bricking himself with his conscience. He's, he's got a terrible problem with his conscience. He kept saying, but why? He's, this man has done nothing wrong. What's the matter? Now, when I was a very young man, I uh, was living in what was the Soviet Union. And um, in schools, there was a subject called atheism. There was a subject called atheism, believe it or not. And that I, I remember reading through a textbook of, uh, that was a, te a school textbook. And it was full of, I guess, and it was full of, of, yeah, the Bible's rubbish because of look at all these contradictions. And I remember reading there uh, in this, this school textbook, high school textbook, that, oh, here's an example where the Bible is definitely rubbish. It's about the trial of Jesus before Pilate. And this textbook quotes at length, uh, it's all in Russian, but it quotes at length all the uh, historians of the first century talking about Pilate. And they say Pilate was a man without any conscience. Shh, Ticha. Yeah. Pilate was a man without any, any conscience, that he was totally without conscience, that he's a kind of guy who'd be walking down the street and said, oh, kill those uh, 15 men over there. Oh, yeah, just kill that pregnant woman there. Right, the bloke had no conscience, he just got a kick out of uh, beating people up. And multiple testimonies to this, that this guy was conscienceless. And so this miserable Soviet atheism textbook that I was reading, was quoting all these historians, and then it quotes the stuff we're reading here, the New Testament record, and says, but, guys, excuse me, guys, if you're going to talk, you have to go outside, okay? Okay. So, and then it quotes all these, this material from the Gospels, uh, saying that 
Uh, oh, you know, definitely, uh, Pilate's got his conscience. He's not talking about the same guy. This is rubbish. No, they're rubbish. And, but I remember it because I had never, I was a young, very young guy, and I had never encountered that argument before until I read, read it. I remember sitting there, flat, reading this. Wow. And I thought about it, and then I got it. That sure, the historians are correct. This guy has no conscience. The Bible is also correct. That this guy had no conscience. But when he encountered Jesus, especially the idea of his death, oh, yeah, he, he, his conscience kicked in. Absolutely, psychologically credible, I would say. So, we have all got that same voice of conscience. And surrender to it. You remember what uh, the Lord said to Paul when he was on the road to Damascus. Stop kicking against the cattle prods. You know, like an animal that wants to go the wrong way, but it hits the pointy prod. Oh, well, what's the point in keep bashing yourself? Just go the way that you've got to go. And so that is it with us. That's why I encourage people to be baptised, to say yes to not, not of any denomination or, or whatever, but to, to him, to that call of conscience which there is. So, the Jews likewise, when the obvious thing is put to them, that, well, what, what's he done wrong? They're the more urgent, and they say, oh, he's stirring up the people. He didn't stir up the people. This is not true. So, as I say, every time you are tempted to open your mouth in, uh, in self-defense, and oh, that's unjust, you know, there's people who fall into depression, into addictions, because they struggle with injustice. Yes, the injustice is real. Absolutely, I don't deny it. But, look at this. Here is the ultimate in injustice, in false accusation, lies, and so forth. And yet, the Lord Jesus is silent through it all. And Paul actually talks about that in the, later on, and he says, Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. And you kind of expect to read some great speech of Jesus before Pilate. There is no speech before Pilate. There is simply this one word, actually in the Greek it is one word, when Pilate says, so are you the king of the Jews? And he says, you say it. Yeah. In Greek that's just the one word. And so, his good witness was simply him being silent. And very often that's how it is, that uh, silence is so difficult. So difficult. So difficult to zip your lips. So hard. You know, who has not failed in that? And this is where Jesus is our hero. Somebody absolutely in our human situations, but zipped his lips when if anybody had the, the right to stand up and say, oh, you know, no, no, that's not true. You say that I, I talk not to give tribute to Caesar. No, actually the other way around. I did uh, tell you that you should give tribute to Caesar. I said you should. Uh, but he doesn't. He doesn't make the obvious self-defense. Well, if you put the other records together, even Pilate's wife is freaked out about this. Well, when Pilate heard that Jesus was from Galilee, he asked whether he were a Galilean, and when he knew that he was of Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem in those days. Well, again, he's desperate. This powerful, conscienceless man, Pilate, who just kills people at random, uh, when it comes to the Lord Jesus, he's the voice of conscience is so hard for him to resist. He's like, oh, maybe I could put this onto, uh, onto Herod. Well, Herod governed, governed Galilee, that's up in the north, and Pilate was looking after Jerusalem. And the, the supposed crimes of the Lord Jesus were basically in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem. It, it, the case had been brought in Jerusalem. It was for Pilate to judge it, not Herod. But on oh, any chance, I might get myself off this, off my conscience. Well, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had for a long time desired to see him, because he'd heard about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but Jesus made no answer. So Herod wants 
Jesus, uh, oh, to do a miracle. You know, Jesus Christ, superstar and all that. Walk across my swimming pool and, uh, and all that stuff. You know, I doubt he had a swimming pool, but anyway. But hold on, who, who, who's Herod? Herod had killed John the Baptist and Herod had tried to kill Jesus. You know that from earlier in Luke where they say to Jesus, get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. So on one hand, Herod wanted to kill Jesus and had killed John the Baptist, but now, oh, he really wants to meet Jesus. He hopes he might see a miracle, and he's got lots of questions for Jesus. This confirms the theme that I'm trying to develop, that Herod had a conscience. Herod had a conscience, and Jesus says nothing. Why? Not because he's being rude, but because... He doesn't have to say anything. You know in your conscience everything that you're asking me. It's like when they say, you're the son of God. So, well, you, so you say, you know that I am. You say that I am. You know that I am. Are you the king of Israel? Pilate has just asked him. And he says, you say it. In other words, you know. You have all these answers in your consciences. So, he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, of course, falsely accusing him. They were, as it were, like the devil to him, which means diabolos, the, the false accuser. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him, dressing him in gorgeous apparel, and sent him back to Pilate. And later on, we're going to read that Herod also says that Jesus is innocent and shouldn't be put to death. They beat him up. Yeah, mock him, yes, but no, he shouldn't be put to death. Conscience again. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, but before they'd been enemies. Well, the Bible is so psychologically credible, because how many times have you seen that? That two people who are enemies become friends when they've got a common cause. It might be that you live in a subdivided house, and, uh, well, the garden actually belongs to your flat. But the other two flats, they want to have the garden. Oh, but they hate each other. You know, Jim there and Janet there, they hate each other. But, oh, because Duncan's got access to the garden, oh, Jim and Janet become friends in order to, I don't know, keep Duncan out of the flat because they want the garden. You see it in, um, you know, politics. In the 1970s, Soviet Union uh, had occupied Afghanistan and the West were backing the Taliban. Now they hate each other. The West and the Taliban are fighting each other. But they were best mates because they were fighting the Russians, the Soviet Union, the common enemy. So people ask me, why do you believe the Bible is true? Why do you keep on teaching it? Why do you keep reading it, Duncan? Why do you keep studying it? Well, I could give a number of reasons why I think the Bible is true, but... For me personally, one of the biggest reasons is the way it is so psychologically credible. That is that the whole story is credible in a way that when you read um, other ancient sort of stories and books, they, they don't come over as credible. Whereas what you read in the Bible is credible. This is psychologically credible, that Pilate and Herod should become friends with each other, united against Jesus, when formerly they'd been enemies. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people, and said to them, You brought to me this man as one that perverts the people, and I, having examined him before you, find no fault in him. Three times in this whole miserable account, Pilate is going to say, I find no fault. Neither did Herod. Yeah. Herod also, well, Herod had tried to kill Jesus. But even he, when it comes to it, says, no fault. He sent him back to us. Nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore just find him and release him. But it was necessary for him to release one, two of them at the feast, that is, the Passover. So, the point is that you see a man struggling with his conscience. Maybe we could uh, talk about the, uh, the bread and the cups. The bread and the cups. And 
my point is that we all have that conscience towards God and towards his son. Don't try and act tough. Don't try and put on a front that are, thank you, that it's, uh, it doesn't affect me. And no, I don't believe all that stuff. You are being called by God. Let's all stop making excuses and go the way of conscience. Not this struggle against conscience that you see in Saul of Tarsus before he, he gave in. That you see in Pilate. That you see in so many people. Finding all sorts of dumb, stupid, meaningless excuses why you don't want to believe. Why you don't want to live the life that you should lead. There is all joy and peace through believing. And if we don't want that joy and peace, well, we won't have it. But this is actually the only way to go. The way of faith in Jesus Christ and going his way with all your heart, soul and mind is actually the only way. There actually is no other real alternative. The alternative is a miserable life, quite honestly. Kicking against the goad, kicking against the, the, uh, the, the cattle prod of conscience all the time. So let's, um, let's give thanks to God for the, uh, the bread and the cup. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these symbols of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for them. We pray that you will help us to live in him, with him, with a, the answer of a good conscience. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, well, the KFC is, um, is there, is it not? So let's, um, let's, uh, let's just give thanks to the food. Okay, Caden, we're going to pray now. Heavenly Father, through the Lord, we thank you so much for your son and for all that we have seen and known in him. And we thank you also, Father, for this place where we can meet and learn about him. And we thank you for the KFC and all you give us. And we pray that we might follow the path and the voice of conscience, not making excuses, but going your way, now and forevermore, for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.